Last time we proved this theorem about the number of compositions of k into n parts is given by this binomial coefficient. One of the reasons for weak compositions that we counted the size and the number of parts was to make the problem finite. But with a strong composition, our smallest part is one, so we can't have infinitely many parts if we fix k. So another problem that we could ask ourselves, another question, which we'll state as a theorem, is what happens if we remove the constraint on n and we just want to count compositions of k and we don't mind about the parts. So that's what we want to count next. The number of compositions of k, any number of parts I'll emphasize, is what? So when we're faced with a problem like this, of course what we want to do is some examples. So let's gather some data. We could figure it out algebraically, but it's nice to get an intuition for what you think the answer is before you go off and try to prove it. So let's just start small. If k equals one, what are the compositions? Well, this is it. Okay, what are the compositions of two? Well, I could have two, or I could have one, one. What are the compositions of three? Well, I could have three, I could have two, one, I could have one, two, or I could have one, one, one. So I can look at this data and I can ask myself, what's the pattern? Do I see some structure here? Well, I've got one, two, four. Okay, I could maybe start guessing it's gonna be powers of two. And that's not a bad guess, given that I have binomial coefficients around. And then I can ask myself, okay, it's two to the what? In terms of K, right? Well, two to the zero, two to the one, two to the two, so I'm gonna state that it's gonna be two to the k minus one. All right, there's our nicely stated conjecture. Let's prove it. So the proof is pretty easy. We're gonna use this formula that we have here. So if we're looking at compositions of k into any number of parts, that means we're just summing up all the n's here. So ask yourself, what are the possible values of n? What does n range from? The number of parts. Well, you have to have at least one part. And what's the most number of parts you can have? Well, the most number of parts that you can have is k. Why k? Because um, it, each part is at least one, so you can't go past that in terms of your number of parts. Okay, so this is what we're trying to count. Great. Now, I wanna change my indexing a little bit so I'm gonna change this indexing down here. I'm gonna let i equal n minus one. That way this amount here is gonna become i. So that's gonna make it a little cleaner for me. And I'm also gonna to have to change the top of my summation. So I'm gonna sum from i equals zero. Now the biggest n could be is k, so the biggest i can be is k minus one. And now I have the binomial coefficient k minus one choose i. And now this, it doesn't matter that it's k minus one, you can think of that as m if you like. This, by the binomial theorem and lots of other ways, is just two to the k minus one. And that's our proof. So it's pretty straightforward, it's pretty easy, but when we have something that's counted by such a nice formula, it's often a good idea to ask yourself, how can I relate that to something else that I know that's counted by the same nice formula? Well, what else is two to the k count? Well, two to the k minus one also equals the number of subsets of the numbers one, two, all the way up to k minus one. So I can ask myself, is there a way that I can relate that, relate this combinatorial description to these objects? Well, let me do something by generating my data set. I know it's gonna give the same enumeration, but what I'm looking at is the structure here in a bijection. So let's try to do the subsets here and let's start at the beginning. So we'll start with um, k minus one. So k minus one equals zero. Okay, so if k minus one equals zero, this is the case where k equals one, then I want subsets of the empty set. Okay, so that's just the empty set. So what about when k minus one equals one? Okay, now I have the empty set is always a subset. Also, I have the set containing just one. And when k minus one equals two, again, I'll, I'll emphasize what are my k's here. It's good to keep them both in mind. Well, I've got the empty set. I've got one. I've got two. 
and I've got one too. So I can try to look and say, is there a way that I can line these things up to match? Well, just one, this guy here has to somehow match with the empty set. There's no other way to see that it happened like that, right? And now I just wanna say, okay, well, which of these guys am I gonna match up with the empty set? And which one am I gonna, and how can I think of this structure? And it's a little tricky right now to kind of see it and to think about how you're gonna go about doing it. But what we can do is we can think about, well, I think these compositions are numbers and they're gonna add up to K. And here I have the numbers up to K. So I can think over here about taking maybe partial sums. Like if I take this guy, I can think about how could I get some numbers that are close to K? Well, I have one and then I have one plus two and that'll be a different number. Unfortunately, that gives me a subset of the numbers one up to K. Hmm. So if I do this idea, then here, what would I get? I would get one, one plus one. I'm just taking the partial sums from the beginning and one plus one plus one. So that would sort of be the set one, two, three. So if I added the number three in here and I, let's see, one and three, and I added the number three in here, let's see, what does this one do? This gives me two and two plus one. So that's actually this one, two, three. This is one, three. And this, instead of being the empty set, is just three. So actually, it's a little hard to see here, but two to the K minus one is the number of subsets of the numbers one, two, all the way up to K that include K. That's another way that I could think of this. If I add the number K to every set, so here the K is two, so I add two, add two, here K is one, I add one, then, okay, I haven't changed how many subsets there are because I'm always doing something deterministic. But now it looks like maybe I can find a way to line up these sets of objects with these sets of objects. So explore this idea, look for the structure, and that will help you with one of the problems on your homework this week.